No. Well, I think the answer is how do you become yourself? Mm -hmm. Because you can be an Imagineer at your company or at my company or wherever you are. It's a skill set that you've cultivated in yourself that's marketable in a certain way. You know, it might be better to get my feet wet, you know, at a, at a smaller company and do something that I can then leverage to go on into the, 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 the Disney's and the Universal's mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. forth. I can do things in wet without asking anybody, even my Coney wife. Coney Island, world's biggest barrel of fun. And anywhere else your imagination takes you. Okay, we've done that now, Mark. You get the whole show now, you hurry, hurry, hurry. Anything's possible at Disneyland. Welcome aboard the Themed Attraction Podcast, where we take you for a ride. Through the fascinating world of theme park design, that is. You've just set sail with us on a voyage of discovery and discussion with theme park industry masters of the craft. I'm your skipper, Freddie Martin, and riding the river with me today is theme park designer, master planner, and chief creative officer of Storyland Studios, Mel McGowan. Where are we sailing to today, Mel? Well, today we're sharing part two of the interview we did with Tony Baxter back in December of 2018. Tony was uh, WDI's former senior VP of creative development who led an incredible time of creati creativity, growth, Disneyland and Disney parks worldwide. When you think of the e-tickets like the Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, Star Tours and the Indiana Jones Adventure, you're thinking of Tony's work. But what's most surprising about Tony is his resolve to create the best possible show for guests while remaining true to the Disney brand and spirit. Yeah, that's true. Well, we, we hope you're just as excited as we are to gather around the storyteller's fire once again and hear more from Disney legend Tony Baxter. All right, folks, keep your hands, arms, feet, and legs inside the boat because this episode is about to leave the dock. Hit it, Sam. Well, Mel, here we are back at the Storyland Studios Blue Sky Suite. Um, fun place to get creative and uh, think about creative things. I um, Thanks for having us back. You're welcome. <laughs> it's always, always great to be home. <laughs> yeah, it's a, a good place to really think and be inspired to move forward and uh, with great ideas. So uh, in our interview with Tony Baxter um, that we did back in uh, December of 2018, uh, there's a lot that uh, Tony shared with us that uh, was really inspiring. Uh, but I think the thing that impressed me most about Tony was his tight grip on that uh, that thing that Disney has that guests and the people who work there really have to hold on to tightly. There's, there's this special magic sauce uh, that they have that means a lot to people. And he has a, such a great grip on that that it made it you know, even um, his mission to hold on to that for the people, whether a project was pulling out that away, he would try and bring it back. And we saw him uh, doing that both with the uh, leaders above him, uh, the executives at Disney, as well as for the people below him. So um, I wanted to dig in with you a little bit about leadership. So uh, what role do you see that leadership plays, especially in themed uh, entertainment, design, uh, et cetera. What does leadership play, especially with, with creatives uh, in theme park design? Well, when I think of leadership, I think, uh, you know, in a way, I, I almost define it in contrast to just pure management, you know? So it's it's a different thing to just command and control, have the authority to just dictate, right? Right. Leadership is about you know, leading, influencing. And I think one of the best models of that is this idea of, of, of serving, you yeah. know, being a, essentially a servant leader. And, you know, what you can clearly sense from people like Tony and Tom is this genuine passion, right? They, they can uh, they can still be fans, even That's right. though it, it would be very easy to be jaded, you know, through all these political upheavals and decades of change, uh, but to still be a fan at heart, to, to really be able to empathize like Walt did, to to get yourself in the guest shoes and actually enjoy the parks and, and, and the environments and, and have personal memories that you've yeah. made. Um, so I think there's a kind of a triangulation of, of that empathy for the, the end user, the guest, if you will. Uh, but then also, obviously, to be able to to be a creative, to be a designer, to have that artistic, uh, you know, outlet, but not to hold that in contrast to um, either the guests. But then I, I think the third 
trinity of that kind of tension is uh, kind of you can call it the executive, the owner, man, you know, actual corporate management. Again, those those issues of budget, scope, schedule, throughput, yeah, right. efficiency, um, and I, I don't even think of that as so much as lining shareholder pockets. I, I actually think of that more as the frontline cast member employees that yeah, have to, right. to deal with the operational realities of this problem that you may be either causing or alleviating, you yeah. know? And again, the idea of, of empathizing and putting yourselves in the shoes of all these different kind of sometimes competing demands and roles, I think the, the people that can do that well and can at least be uh, really great uh, askers of questions and, <laughs> and, and even better listeners, yeah. um, rather than just, again, a pure creative outlet and, and, and spokes models and, yeah. and um, you know, uh, pitch men. I think that's that's a real key to, to leadership, uh, you know, on the creative side of what we do. And it also, you know, from top down, it leads people to be authentically caring about the needs of the guests, um, whether it's their entertainment or their, you know, um, their needs to be able to get up to a sidewalk and step over it safely. Uh, things like that all all come from stem from good leadership. Um we uh, before we dive into this episode, we need to set the stage again. Um, this took place in Tony's breakfast nook at his cabin up in the mountains. Um, yeah, just picture uh, you know uh, Geppetto's. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It does. Cottage, basically. It and, did and look like there. a cuckoo clock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and also in the room with us is Mike Mulligan. Uh, he's a Storyland Studios uh, staffer, team member. Uh, he's good friends with Tony, so we invited him to uh, join us on the podcast. And uh, one more thing. Uh, if you're listening to this podcast for the very first time, you do you should go back and listen to uh, the first um, the first part of this Tony Baxter interview because we're diving right in um, and we want to make sure you're you're totally caught up because it might sound like it's coming right in the middle of a uh, conversation. That's because it is. And so we want you to go back to listen to that one, listen to past episodes, even go back to our episode two and three where we uh, interview Tom Morris uh, because he and Tony uh, share a lot of the same um, same stories but from different angles. So, Mel, are you ready for this Let's fun roll. ride? All right, good. Here's uh, part two of our two-part interview with legendary Disney Imagineer Tony Baxter. So you've worked with so many different executives, the Disney C-suite executives that you've worked for, what, a half dozen or more? Mm -hmm. And um, as a creative uh, in this industry, what is it like to work through that and your interaction between them? How, how is it as a creative to work in that environment? Well, it's difficult. <laughs> okay, we're done. <laughs> uh, I, I guess I'd parallel it with uh, the animation department because they're kind of our – you know, ghost partners in, we never work together, but we sympathize with their relationships too. And if you look at that group under, you know, the management that remained after Walt's passing, the, I guess you'd characterize a lot of it like, would Walt do this? Or maybe Walt would do this, or here's something we didn't develop that Walt saw. Maybe we can develop that. And so there isn't much passion for I have this idea that's burning a hole in me and it's got to get out there it's got to yeah. be it's like mm -hmm. well maybe this will work and you know John told a story of in some office John Lasseter um, being told you weren't hired to come up with ideas you were hired to draw so get back to your table and draw mm -hmm. and he was trying to convince them to explore 3D animation with mm -hmm. Where uh, where the wild things mm, oh, right. go or whatever the, the wild the things things are. Are. Murray Sendex book, and um, that's sort of I think uh, a, a situation you uh, run into when you're dealing with caretaker management mm -hmm. that's been given a task of we don't want to mess anything up and this guy was great and we've got to do what he wanted, uh, but then you don't bring anything new to the table and then you know this exuberant Disney had kind of dug a hole. And so when Michael Eisner and Frank Wells came in, you know, going out of a hole, which is negative zero, negative zero, getting, there's nowhere to go. The song that ends Mary Poppins returns, mm -hmm. there's nowhere to go but up. Yeah. You know? yeah. And it's a wonderful song. And it says so much about them coming in. You know, Katzenberg just revived the animation with Roy mm -hmm. Disney and, uh, 
you know, they came over, they admitted they knew nothing about building parks. Mm -hmm. They would learn. And they, I was lucky to be one of the people they trusted. Mm -hmm. And so they looked at my accomplishments and they said, that's a pretty good bank account. I'd done Journey into Imagination. I'd done um, the uh, Big Thunder Mountain. And I had several other concepts in work, Star Wars. And they turned that on right away. It was all in one day. They came over on a Saturday and he brought his young son, Breck. This is Michael's son, Breck Eisner. And he says, Breck's 14. He loves theme parks. I don't know anything about theme parks. So I hope you don't mind if he gives his opinion. And I go, great, my career. But <laughs> like it was big. great. Be <laughs> it was because beginning. I had never given a presentation to my audience. Yeah. My oh, eventual. Wow. So you're always converting it to make it appealing to people that are dealing with, <laughs> will the stockholders you know, think we're crazy yes. investing and all this. And here's a kid. He goes, Dad, that's awesome. You know, and, then I, and he says, okay, what else have you got? We're doing that. What else? Yeah. And like that, we were doing Star Wars, Star Tours. And then uh, I had Splash Mountain, and I'm going, he won't like Br'er Rabbit and Br'er Bear and all that. He's 12 years old. So I really featured the dip drop yeah. in the middle in the dark and that you'd have this highest, steepest <laughs> waterfall. And then I, I slipped in the story of, of uh, Br'er Bear and Br'er Fox and all that. And he said, Dad, that's even better than the Star Wars attraction. Wow. <laughs> he goes, hey, okay, we're doing that. So these open like what, next year or the year after that? And see, they knew nothing about five years for Splash yeah. Mountain, three years for... And, but they, yeah. they really jumped and they said, okay, you take the time you need for that, but you're not going to tell me you can't have a movie here next year, next summer. So who's the hottest director? Coppola. Who's the hottest you know, young star today? Michael Jackson. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. um, so get them together and then bring in George Lucas just for good measure. And then he looked at all of us and said, they will have a movie here. You have the theater to put it in for next summer. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that was how Captain EO happened. You know, wow, just crazy. like that. And that's how the preview yeah. uh, outside the ride so, so forward. I mean, come yes. below. Yeah, right. You go, go from caretaker, like, what are we going to do? And what, you know, won't, won't rock the block, block box. And everybody will think this is just like Walt would do and all that. To we want to shake this up and show people there's life and mm -hmm. vitality in Disneyland. And so the whole idea that scared everyone to death of Star Wars coming in with Lucas mythology to Disneyland was suddenly that is going to say something to the people we want it to say, that mm -hmm. Disneyland is part of the modern yeah. world. Mm -hmm. And Michael Jackson having an attraction at Disneyland is going to say a ton. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the second flavor. I think now it's sort of, you know, the third group is is strong management from a business end that lets its divisions do their own thing rather than there being a corporate, you know, synergy. So you look at Marvel, which is doing amazing things. Mm -hmm. um, you look at Lucasfilm, which is still on top. You look at Pixar. You look at Disney Animation. You look at the attractions. But I don't think there's quite the we all get together for... Uh, picnics and stuff that we actually did. I remember asking the TV guys, what are they working on and what, what's the big things coming? Mm -hmm. I don't think that happens. I think each group now is charged with not letting any other group get better than they are. You know, mm -hmm. So there's sort of a competitive, you know, carrying the weight you know, of each of the divisions. And that brings a different kind of challenge because you go from corporate management and, and wise divisional management sort of sits back and let the corporate people say because they know they're going to say anyway to now the divisional management has to make the actual calls and if they're right they're going to get yeah. rewarded if they're wrong they're going to take the blame you yeah. know so whereas before in in the michael frank era you know you could throw your hands up and say i'm only doing what they wanted me to do and you'd probably be fine uh, you know so yeah. i didn't have a problem with that because i i was completely compatible with their way of thinking mm. and they were completely supportive of my idea so that was great and my management at the WDI level was supportive of we like the fact that they like Tony and the things come out good and all of that is working <laughs> but when Frank died and, and Jeffrey spun off DreamWorks out of the animation you can look at what happened to those animated films they went from the greatest movie Lion King uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Beauty, and the, Beauty Beast, and the Beast to Aladdin. what is it Home on the Range and yeah. the, uh, the Emperor's New Groove and yeah. things like that that not bad but they're not 
classics yeah. in a sense that um so you know i think that's you you're kind of batted around and you know your working style has to adjust to the the way in which they want you to perform and so you're not always given the opportunity of being as best as you possibly can if you want to survive in a corporate thing a lot of people will take that cue when there's a a traumatic change in management like that to leave yeah mm -hmm. go out and do your thing and then when everyone goes we really have gotten ourselves into a problem here you're the first one to come back because they're all going he was smart enough to see the yeah, writing on the wall yeah. and he got out and now he's done these things on the outside let's bring him back yeah. because maybe he can pull us out mm -hmm. of the rut mm -hmm. so you know that's you know there's no formula of how to work under those things you decide for yourself i work best in this way i can survive in this way and i'm going to fail in this way yeah. and if you're going to fail in that way you better get out yeah mm -hmm. you know because you're not going to help yourself or them yeah oh that's you great know. tony i'm curious on um you know i just wrote a, a little essay for um themedattraction.com our blog on on the value of backstory you know and yet You've certainly used employed backstory, um, you know, certainly for an individual attraction, for a shop, an environment. But when you're looking at the scale of an entire land, um, and I'm thinking of like uh, frontier lands uh, in Disneyland Paris, you know, where there's kind of a continuous storyline mm -hmm. and it mm -hmm. ties it into this actual fictional town. And the Haunted Man the Phantom Manor is actually related to Big Thunder and related to... Um, is there pros and cons with that versus... Well, yes, yeah. there is. <laughs> I, I think, you know, backstories... and. Michael is dying to ask a question, so after I, we finish this waiting. one. Uh, <laughs> backstories, I think it, it's a cliche that's gotten overused, and you got to be careful with it. It should be there to inform the designers, but if it gets too complicated where you know, you're trying to explain it to guests or something and they can't understand the concept without an explanation, you're in trouble. And I, I won't give any... There's some recent examples that I feel are way too intellectualized. Uh, but let me give you one that's I think can be talked about safely now. You, you mentioned Frontierland, Fantasyland, Adventureland, and Tomorrowland. Those are so clear both from the design standpoint and the visitor standpoint that you could stand a family with children and a grandparents and say, do you want to go to the world of tomorrow, the world of fantasy, the world of the western frontier, or into deepest Adventureland? And you kind of know the world. And so would a designer know, if I've got to build a ride for that area or an attraction, I know what to do. Mm. Go over to California Adventure, and on opening day, <clears throat> we had a major area called Condor Flats. What do you build there? Do you build <laughs> things where we watch buzzards eating roadkill? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't I don't know. And I tried to explain that. I said, you know, if you take soaring and the river raft mm -hmm. and the climbing trail, the nature climbing trail or whatever mm -hmm. it is, and ask yourself, is there a categorical blend on that? I would say it comes close to being California extreme. Mm -hmm. And in the morning when the kids run in, I put myself into like, okay, I'm a kid and I've got my thing. Let's go to California extreme. I want to ride the, rock, the raft ride. I want to go soaring on a hang glider and I want to climb in the trees and everything. And if I'm a designer, okay, we need a new attraction for California extreme. Mm -hmm. So you're immediately thinking, what could we do with surfing, skiing, of yeah. all of yeah. the things that you know that would ignite it in your, and strengthen the land. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it becomes stronger because it's got a new e-ticket that lets you ski or lets you you know surf or whatever that continues to build on that the same way that bringing Indy to Adventureland mm -hmm. strengthens Adventureland. So you know I think backstory to that level, what is California Stream? Nothing other than a, a jumping off point for your mind to understand what the grouping of things might mm -hmm. be, you know, and... Uh, Maybe a bungee jumping yeah. at point? Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah, exactly, a bungee, of course. You know, so, I mean, right away, and you, you, you're, you're taking people from, I don't know what to do, and the frighteningness of Marty Scalar's blank paper, to we've got to do something that really celebrates extreme sports in California. Mm -hmm. So it's also got that. So you've got now a nice box that... It sets into motion a lot of thinking that gets you right to bungee mm -hmm. before, you know, instead of sitting there, out of all the things we could do for condors, you know, 
you know, and, and besides Condor, yeah, Rio, right. <laughs> and so, you know, Pacific <laughs> Wharf. What is that other than boats? You know, it yeah, yeah. just doesn't yeah. give you any. Like, what are the textures and the things yep. that are, the smells, you know, smells going like there? So that to me, that was a big miss mm -hmm. uh, in the early California to not come up with definitions. I mean, Hollywood probably mm -hmm. is the strongest one, mm -hmm. but then they didn't decide. Is it? insider Hollywood, so we're on the back lot, right. or is this Sunset or Hollywood Boulevard that you're walking Glamour down? Time and, yeah. and you look at it one way and it's kind of like real, and then mm -hmm. over here there's girders and steel holding it up like mm -hmm. it's fake. And so it, it falls apart on that end that it's, uh, and I would, have, I would have gone in and really, uh, you know, intensified it as real. Mm -hmm. I would have put a Broadway show down at the Hyperion and mm -hmm. gussied it up and made a, one of the best theaters in LA and mm -hmm. I think I would have turned the Muppet Theater into the El Capitan mm -hmm. and had our first run opening films always mm -hmm. in there so it began to build this every great premiere like should have been Mary Poppins mm -hmm. on that block I think they did do Lone Ranger down yeah, there, right, but right. That, wasn't, that didn't help it that much so yeah. um, even though that's one of my favorite movies but that's for another <laughs> story um, so yeah, I think the backstories, I think where we've gotten a little bit out of hand is people write these very complicated stories <clears throat> that need to be understood for you to walk through the space and get why the things are there. And that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got to be kept at a level where it helps you in conceptualizing, but you know, once it's now a thing, people have to walk through it and know intuitively what it's all about. Mm -hmm. Do you remember, um, was it down in Florida, the nightclub area was called Pleasure Island. Pleasure yeah. Island. Mm -hmm. There was a thing about Mary was rather pleasure, and he did built this whole thing. And the guests are looking at rather modest facility buildings. You know, they're not something built 40, 50, 60 years ago and used for rum running and all this stuff that the story is told. And, it, you know, it's just, it's belabored to where people just want to go and dance, you know, mm -hmm. and so... Um, you know, you, you got to be careful if you're going to do a massive backstory like that. Like the Indy ride, you know, uh, at Disneyland, you know, you boil it down. And we, we thought, okay, people are going to stand in line five hours at the beginning, and now it's about an hour. Why? And so we came up with the thing that if you do everything we say, you'll get wealth, or eternal youth, mm -hmm. or visions of, tomorrow, of the future. And I, you, you look around the world, and people wait in line at Lourdes to be cured and... You know, mm -hmm. they stand in Vegas for all hours to bet on horse races and mm -hmm. everything. So there's, you know, a, a, a feeling strong in my mind that, you know, if we really could grant those things, that's a, a logical reason why all these people have come to the jungle and are yeah. lined up yeah. to go in it. But does the whole thing fall apart if you don't, you know, know that? No, it doesn't matter. I don't think... 90% of people writing pirates know that, oh, that's the mayor being dunked yeah, in the right. wall. Mm -hmm. Takes well, several then, rights yeah. to know that, that. And so even the changes that have gone on there, they're so esoteric that the public, I don't think, reads that deep into those stories mm -hmm. that, oh, the, the, they're auctioning off all of their uh, possessions now instead yeah, right. of the women for brides. It's all their cuckoo clocks and their jewelry <laughs> and all that. And, well, why are the pirates buying the jewelry i don't yeah, know, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. You know anyway, they I, would just steal it you know? steal yeah so i don't know i would you know i i, I think you've got to have a backstory mm -hmm. just to give it a, a credibility uh but it, once it becomes something you have to know in your head or the scene isn't readable mm -hmm. yeah. then you've crossed the line mark davis was the best at visual thinking i think of all the animators um, you take like the guy balancing the hats mm -hmm. yeah. who's got one foot in the boat <laughs> and one foot on the land and he's got he's taken stolen so many hats that he can't balance yeah. properly and we can all identify with the fact he's stealing yeah. the fact that he's <laughs> about to fall in the drink and it's a pose that can go on endlessly which is the limitations of audiometronics mm -hmm without it feeling contrived. And it reads instantly. Yeah, and it's instantly. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, we don't need to know that his mother was a milliner and he's taking these <laughs> to go and replenish her millinery supply. <laughs> That's but that the is the real backstory. Yeah. 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 Let's say that it is. So you heard it here first. This yeah. is it. Uh, another you know, you know, moment of the pirate ride has been revealed for the first time. <laughs> That's the backstory. Yeah. yeah, or the, the Baxter story. The, the Baxter. Oh, no, that yeah. is. 
as, as, as sane as anything else, yeah. I suppose. Well, one of the things I was going to ask that, that kind of uh, doing a little bit of a callback, you know, when you were talking about uh, as you're thinking about the lands and as you're thinking about, you know, well, what is Condor Flats? You know, what what is more of uh, extreme? What is the sports extreme? What is this? What is this? Um, one of the more important things, you know, um, that you have around here at your cabin is you have, you know, um, down at your other house and everything else is um, that I love seeing are uh, you're, you're so physically invested into building things yourself. Mm-hmm. And one of the, one of the most important things for, for anybody who's part of spatial storytelling is being able to actually tell a complete story from beginning to end. And it, it backstory is part of it. Um, but it's also finishing that up. So, so neatly and it's all the little details so you know looking at it from a child's point of view as they walk into that space of thinking okay what is what is this seven-year-old who's never been here before what are they thinking and and is it also going to be accessible for ADA now architecturally how is this going to fit together and everything so being more renaissance um, I mean how many skills you know, to basically, if you were to tell somebody now to do what you do, and somebody says, oh, man, you know, how, how can I do what you do? <laughs> we're like, well, you have to live an entire lifetime to acquire all these. But, yeah. you know, how, I don't know. What's what's your... Uh, That's a... <laughs> I don't know. It's no. a statement question, I guess. But I do think there's something, and I don't know how to put my finger on it either, because um, I have a friend down in the other house who says... You know, I'll, I'll buy something new, and it's sitting there mm-hmm. like, yeah, you know, prop from the movie The Ten yeah. Commandments or something. And I, my house is not Egyptian, but here <laughs> are these Egyptian things. It's a museum. And she'll look at me and say, you know, I know I'm not worried about that being there because I know you have a knack for figuring out where it goes, mm-hmm. and it might sit there for a year, and then I come along. Like I just did an office, and I love sideshow collectibles. I, they make these. <laughs> What are they? Premium yeah, size figures beautiful. of Captain yeah, America and Indiana Jones and whatnot. And I've had them scattered all over the house because you know where do you put them? And I, I finished <laughs> an office and I decided the theme of that room or the story backstory yeah. is going to be these heroes. Yeah. The, it's where I'm going to do my work and I'm going to surround myself with you know heroes. So you know if you go way back, it's Lincoln and Moses. And uh, I don't. I probably. That, oh, we're, we'll we'll get that. Only, the phone's only ringing. Two rings. It's Hello, neighbor. Uh, <laughs> Hello. Keep Hi, going. is this Dylan? Yeah. And where are you? We're not listening in on Tony's conversation. <laughs> we're talking amongst ourselves. Well, why why don't you go down to the. Um... <laughs> I'm doing a giant podcast, and you just interrupted one, two, three, four, five, Hi. six people. <laughs> Dylan is apologizing from Universal. Hi, Hi Dylan. We'll, we'll have you on next. We'll get you on a podcast here for telling the secrets of Universal's design. Sorry about that. that. No, no, that's okay. Now, would you right. restate that long? No, I, yeah, that, I, I, I've got So we're coming one. back after Tony's uh, very important phone yeah. call about dinner plans. Well, this was supposed to be dinner plans, yeah. not a podcast. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we were talking about the ability to take discordant things and bring them together to tell a consistent story mm-hmm. or at least feel compar- compatible with one another. Mm-hmm. And so I was putting my office together, and I thought... I've got all these things scattered all over and, you know, there's three rooms that aren't saying anything. And so I decided the office is going to be, you know, all around the people that have inspired me, the heroes I've had through my whole life. And that goes back to Lincoln. And, and of course, before Lincoln opened at Disneyland, I was infatuated with uh, DeMille's Moses. Yeah. I just, mm-hmm. Before, there, were, there weren't science fiction movies of the sense that we have today, or Marvel and Lucasfilm and, and everybody since 2001 has had the capability to amaze you with incredible effects. The Ten Commandments did that back. Mm-hmm. You had to wait through three hours of backstory, if you will. <laughs> because you've seen me do this over and over again, and you still don't believe. So stand back and behold, and then 
the ocean parts and all yeah. this stuff. So Moses is a real, especially Charlton Heston Moses, yeah. is a really big yeah. superhero to me. Oh, yeah. And then Mary Poppins, you know, I thought, you know, she in a way saves this family. And the new movie is even better at doing that. In a, in a way, it's not. I'm not saying it's better than the original movie, but it's a damn good movie, and she is in the same position. So, and then you go on up into the more modern ones. Indiana Jones changed my life, mm-hmm. um, and so I've put together this room of heroes, you know, and I've got you know posters and you know sideshow things and a bust from the guy that did the lincoln figure for disneyland um and some moses things of course and and so it now you look at it and you go that works i get i get the story of what is linking all these things where if you had captain america in the room downstairs and indy in the tv room because he's a a character you see in movies and Mm -hmm. Um, Moses in the living room area because he's kind of generic and mm-hmm. fits there. It, it doesn't. It's not telling a story. So um, bringing them together, I think, is it gets to this non-threatening backstory that's so complicated that nobody can figure it out. It's just I know when people walk in, there's a linkage between all these images that mm-hmm. um, brings it kind of together. Yeah. yeah. And it's certainly more interesting than the desk with all my bills on it. (laughs) You know, at some level, that does strike me as a difference between Disney parks that kind of seem to have a Mm -hmm. central soul Mm -hmm. and a thesis uh, and non-Disney, i.e. maybe Mm -hmm. some uh, other motion picture-based parks that seem to be more of a collection of IPs that lawyers or I can't remember what movie (laughs) I um, saw this year in the derby of what's coming up for Oscars. Um, but everything in the room did not, nothing worked. There were lots of expense put into designing this room. And I sat there and I just drifted right out of the story and the actors, I was going, whoever put this room together didn't know what they were doing. It's like just discordant and the colors weren't, it didn't work or anything like that. And then I watched another one the other night called The Green Book. And it's a great film. And the fellow in that that's the pianist, and he has this very exotic room that looks like Indiana Jones lived in there yeah. or something with a throne and all this nice. stuff. And before you, you in the movie, you're going to learn his personality. But on that first look, when he invites this guy he's hired to do uh, his driving, walks in and the guy is like going, oh, my God, you know. <laughs> and it's so it tells so much story. I mean, yeah. they don't have to say, what, what is your background and what, where did you come from and what is all this? Mm-hmm. You get it. It's yeah. all right there laid out. It's all harmonious. It all works together. And it's mm-hmm. all very discordant and different things, but they all, the art works direction good. on it is, is flawless, you mm-hmm. know. So... Yeah, I think that's a skill that uh, I don't know how to explain how you develop it or you do it. And, <coughs> excuse me, it's not always uh, possible to just sit down on, on the day you acquire something to figure it out. You know, it's like oftentimes you'll walk in a year later and I've been looking at that for a year. It's in the wrong place. You know, that goes over here and this does this. And, and then it sort of happens, you know. Yeah. yeah. How do you tell a story when people listen with more than their ears? Stories change lives. They make us remember, but only when they are felt and not just heard. Storyland Studios builds the impossible. They turn big ideas into reality. They tell stories in three dimensions to stir the senses so you can walk into places you've only ever seen in your dreams, in real life and real time. Storyland's artists, architects, and artisans take stories out of the imagination and build tangible dreams that leave lasting impressions and memories that endure for years. What's your story? Storyland Studios is themed entertainment, destination design, production, and fabrication. Connect with the team at Storyland Studios to get started building your impossible dream today. Visit StorylandStudios.com or call now. 800-218-1932. That's 800-218-1932. Storyland Studios, your big idea's best ally. There's uh, not a lot of us in the industry right now that are working on uh, 
theme park projects that aren't tied to an mm-hmm. IP. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in terms of uh, new lands, it, it generally seems to be the the battle of the bands and the battle of the yeah, IPs yeah. and kind of that's, <laughs> do you think that this is a season? Do you think that uh, there's, uh, again, pros and cons with that approach? Uh, or do you think uh, that this is going to be it for the foreseeable futures? Well, it, you know, it, it comes down to this. You can make a good ride either way or a good attraction. Mm-hmm. You know, I've I've worked with attractions that created IP. Mm-hmm. That's uh, right. <coughs> excuse me, I'm talking myself out. Uh, we did an attraction for Epcot called Journey into Imagination. It is not the attraction that's there now. Uh, it's been removed for like 18 years. Uh, but there are people that grew Tony up Tony just with, washed his hands. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a very, it's a very sad story, and we don't have enough time to go into it. But the original creation of that for the opening of Epcot brought two very different dissimilar characters, a little purple dragon and a steampunky old guy together and they fed off of each other's differences you know Mm -hmm. and through the two differences you were able to create a world and figment in a very compromised role down in epcot is still their number one selling plush thing and and toy and t-shirt and hats and because he he scores with people so it's even possible to create ip but in doing an attraction to do that we came up with an attraction that allowed the guests to be in a theatrical relationship with the characters yep. as opposed to a ride relationship. Mm-hmm. When you ride through a ride, um, the easiest kind are like Peter Pan and Snow White and whatnot, because you go, there's Snow White, there are the dwarfs, there's mm-hmm. the witch. In uh, a ride where you're introducing new characters like Figment and Dreamfinder, oh, there's a rubber dragon and a funky old man. You know, If you don't have a way of explaining that theatrical Mm -hmm. backstory so we created a scene that allowed you to be in sync with those characters for about four minutes while they really spilled their whole story and how figment was created and what dreamfinder is doing and then inviting you to join them on a journey and it was the most uncanny first of all you couldn't figure out how we were doing it and you'd have to write it one or two times to say are we moving or is that moving or how are they you know and but then eventually it sunk in and the story and the endearment of figment uh to the audience became something that allowed it to go the opposite way and become uh ip that is now merchandising ip and I would love to see the company do the Figment movie. I think it would be a runaway hit. With And, and as you know, Marvel did, um, I believe, six or nine, uh, uh, you know, individual comic, uh, you know, episodes of their adventures uh, leading up to the opening of the pavilion at Epcot. Mm-hmm. You know, so it took him back to where Dreamfinder wasn't an old guy, but a, a young, ad- daring adventurer yeah, in the right. 20s. And uh, they were great. And they, they sold better than any non-IP uh, Marvel comics, you know, because uh, it did have a, a sense of uh, awareness that was from the theme park thing. So mm-hmm. it can go that way. And those are fun to do. Big Thunder was fun to do. Um, and then on the other end, who wouldn't dream of getting to do Indiana Jones as yeah. a ride? I mean, like, mm-hmm. those were like my five best years mm-hmm. ever, you know, going up there and, you know, playing with the, the, the clothing in the That's Lucas awesome. Warehouse and saying, well, I think I'll just try on this jacket, you know. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm still jealous of it. Yeah, that. and things like that. Uh, you know, this, the, here's this whip, you know. That's pretty cool. <laughs> and here's a Sankara stone. And, you know, so, yeah. you know, that is pretty cool and and again being an absolute fanatic about the movies you're yeah. you're you're ahead of the game in knowing what it was about them that turned people on yeah. you know and didn't turn on and what you know we had certain things we looked at and said you have to deliver that and it doesn't matter if it's sort of a repeat it has to be in it or it won't be authentic mm-hmm. And George understood that. The first time we had that discussion was on Star Tours. And I was adamant we have the trench run. And uh, ILM, it was, we don't want to do the same thing again, rebuild the same shot and have to do it again. So they had a new thing, but it didn't give you that goosebump moment where as the ship peels down and then it leveled out in the trench and it had to kind of wobble to get going in. Mm -hmm. And even at the Grauman's Chinese, when I saw that in the movie came out, the first film, uh, we're all sitting there just going, oh my God, you know, like that was just like, you waited for that moment in the film, you know, of like, and in. So 
I remember ILM said, we're not going to change what we come up with. So if you want it to go back, you have to get George to tell us to do it. Yeah. So I was sort of pitted, and I made my plea that that will authenticate this attraction. And, mm-hmm. I, you know, we did a lot of things that were new and not done before in that movie. But the trench shot was capped by Rx, the pilot, saying, I've always nice wanted, wanted to do to. this. Yeah. And, like, everyone in the theater is saying the <laughs> yeah, same thing, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And so I felt that was really important. Yeah. And with Indy... Uh, the rolling ball mm-hmm. it carries the same thing it had to be there yeah. it had to be there yeah. and uh, it was so powerful that it shouldn't be the first thing you see it's got to be the finale and I remember they used the same track that's in the indie building for the dinosaur ride that's in Florida and Michael Eisner had taken his ride through there and uh, he gets to the end and he thinks in a very more holistic way than the people that were focused on their dinosaur ride. And he goes, where's the rolling ball? Oh. You know? and, and they go, well, what do you mean the rolling ball? That's the indie ride. He goes, no, you don't get it. The rolling ball is the finale, and it's right there in front of your face at the end. And they had just used the dip, but they hadn't come up with anything there. <laughs> Terrifying. <laughs> Within one week, they had put in the dinosaur head that was static that week that it opened. And then very quickly, they had an audiometronic thing that came That's flying right. out, a big uh, Tyrannosaurus that yeah. you know, scored there at the end. Because Michael had it in his mind, that is the rolling ball moment yeah. of this yeah. attraction. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I thought, That's really interesting. You know, he's categorized the rolling ball as a phenom- <laughs> <the> finale, <laughs> and you don't have a rolling ball, oh, you know. Yeah. So uh, I, that was why I really enjoyed working with him, because I think that's my thing, too, that we have to have that moment here at the end that uh, totally shocks you, yeah, you know, right. and you go, there's no way out. There is no way out of this scene. And then, you know. <laughs> Wow. Well, I want to get us to the wrapping up point, but uh, we do have a lot of just kind of close it out with this this uh, exploration. So we have a lot of our listeners who are they're either students of or they're they're TEA next gen or they're trying to uh, get into the industry. And I'm sure you've been asked the question before. How how do you become an Imagineer? But I, I've heard I've heard it from way too many people that it's well, you learn how to do something well, and you just do it. So I wanted to kind of explore with you a little bit more. You know, you, you've you talked about the importance of being 12 and the idea that uh, that a st- uh, we just lost all of our light. You want that's me okay. to ramp it up? Uh, sure. Sorry, we, no, hard. that's okay. It's okay. The, the lights all went out. and <laughs> It's on a timer. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Yeah. So... Uh, yeah, so they, nobody can answer that question, how do you become an Imagineer? The, what they can a- ask you, the question is, how do you get involved in this and make the most of a career in uh, themed entertainment? I think that's the better. Well, I think the answer is, how do you become yourself? Mm-hmm. Because you can be an Imagineer at your company or at my company or wherever you are. It's a skill set that you've cultivated in yourself that's marketable in a certain way. And, uh, you know, I certainly never dreamed as going through school and all that that I was going to go there. I was preparing to be a teacher. And uh, I thought that's a logical thing and it's a a goal my parents would approve of and uh, all of the things you do. And so I was working at Disneyland and, you know, I love Disneyland. And I thought, going to teach. We'll work at Disneyland on the weekends as a teacher and I'll be happy. And uh, so I, someone said, saw some of my work, and they said, you know, you should take that up to the studio. And I, I'd say the one in that I had, because I certainly didn't know anyone, was that uh, one of the managers at Disneyland, and this was when it was a much smaller company, he goes, well, I'm going, I'm going up to WED next week, which was the name that uh, Creative Area was called. And he took my stuff, and they brought me in, and they said, you're not ready for this, you're not skilled enough, you know, in your talent to draw, you need to go to school, but we see something here, and that uh, we, we think you should get out of the school you're in now and go to into an art school, which I did, and I went back and they hired me to build models. Um, I think that it's a very different world today. The company that I work for, worked for is much bigger, and they don't hire people in that 
um, you'll be a model builder and in 40 years you'll get a Mickey Mouse watch and you'll be a designer. Yeah. You know, you either hire in what you want to do or you come and you go and, you know, project based and all these other things. So that's kind of a downer on one side, but then the immediacy of media and everything today makes there new opportunities mm -hmm. to get seen and to get your products and things out there in ways that, you know, you could spend a year trying to find something back mm -hmm. in that era if you were a prop finder or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I can go online today and find anything I want, yeah. you know. <laughs> so, you know, there's you, you, you can't say, oh, it's too bad it's not the way that it used to be. Uh, it's going to be a lot harder to get in. You're not going to get in and and grow the way that you know it was possible to do then. You're going to have to get in with a skill set that somehow you've been able to uh, make the world aware of mm -hmm. in some way. Uh, doesn't have to be on a grand scale, but in some way uh, there needs to be something there that um, is supportive of your talent. And I think the companies have gone a lot you know, in the opposite direction of helping students. I mean, we, we had a class at UCLA in Imagineering, and all of those students got to present their projects at Imagineering. They were criti criticized by all of the, critiqued is a better word, <laughs> by all of the key people. I did it for many years. They would send all of us down there to do lectures for the class. Um, CalArts is a, is a school that is, you know, funded heavily by Disney. Uh, and uh, a lot of people there at a high school level. There's the Ryman Arts Foundation that Herbie Ryman and Marty Scalar were instrumental in starting where high school kids are given some basic um, background on how you might go forward with a career that way. So those things didn't exist, you know, yeah. in the old days. Um, there's a lot more competition, but then as your company uh, is in business, there weren't multiple companies doing the same thing. There's mm -hmm. Thinkwell and there's Hedema organization mm -hmm. and countless others. The Wonderful. TEA has a book this thick yeah. of mm -hmm. companies that do this kind of work in Europe and in Asia and here in America. So, you know, um, sometimes people have to think, you know, it might be better to get my feet wet, you know, at a, at a smaller company and do something that I can then leverage to go on into. The, the 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 Disney's and the Universals mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. forth. You know. By the way, we're hiring. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> it's true. Yeah. And the by the way, the the guy that you sat across the table from this morning at Waffles, yeah, uh, someone that came in as an intern. We hired him just because he had some construction fabrication yeah. background. Never went to art school, even though his dad was an artist. Mm -hmm. And he's actually one of our top art directors. He's That's amazing. Great. I mean, yeah. he is amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So th those those opportunities are there. Yeah. And it's yeah. like I said, it's. Uh, it's a whole new world, but you can market yourself so much better with the access to these things, too, so that um, if you want to create a website or a blog or whatever, yeah. or a podcast, <laughs> um, these, are, these are tools, again, that, you know, in Wall's day, he might walk by Harriet or Fred in the shop there and say, oh, this is Harriet and this is Fred. And I remember watching the TV and going, man, that would be the <laughs> end all be all. But I never knew who they were. Yeah. You're giving me an hour here to talk about me. Yeah, that's and crazy. So people are hearing these things. So that's in itself, <laughs> you know, something that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. They were all like mystery people. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's a Harriet, that's a Fred, but I don't know what they do or how they live or what anything about them. I never will, you yeah. know, until I actually worked with them. Yeah. And I went, you know, you'd sit there doing your desk thing and you'd look over and go, that's Harriet. She was standing there with Walt Disney in that room, like building that thing, yeah. you know, and that, that, that's that, tremendous. Yeah. So, well, thank you so much. Any last words, any, uh, uh, thing what to go out to, on to spend the day with you, Tony. It I really mean, is. is. What a, an honor to be just a little part of your Christmas tradition here. Up yeah. In the, your, your little well, bit you, of Bavaria. You guys kicked me in the rear to get this going this year. I, I'm glad I did. I've got people coming in in about an hour one. And then they'll start straggling in tomorrow, and by tomorrow night we'll have ten. Man, and uh, this is great. We put on a fire maybe, and and, and uh, watch movies all night. Yeah. <laughs> it's about as Christmas yeah. as you get in Southern yeah. California. Yeah, yeah, it is. Well, usually we'll have some snow, and uh, I'm kind of glad we didn't add that because ice on my driveway can be nasty. Uh -huh. So I'm glad that we got up here and it's nice and dry. Yeah. Well, thank you. Okay. Uh, we hope to have either you on again or you you 
you bring us onto your podcast whenever you do that. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you very much. Uh, it's been a great time. It's been fun. Mel, it's kind of funny, but, you know, sitting with Tony doesn't make you feel less creative. Um, you know, you'd kind of think that you come up against a creative uh, um megalith like the tony baxter that everybody thinks that he is um it actually really kind of led me to see my creativity go up a couple notches just through osmosis huh? yeah i think so i think so um but we also know that tony's like creativity isn't all that it takes to be in this industry you can't just be creative and uh, think that that's going to do it you have constraints to li live with um and live within so uh, what do you think designers, people listening here, whether they're new or they're veterans in the industry, um, what can they do to apply their, their limitless creativity? And that's really what it is. It's limitless to the actual realities of a limited budget scope and scale. Well, we've definitely learned, again, whether it's a $5 a square foot or $5,000 a square foot, that, that really does not... Um, lessen the amount of creativity required. Uh, yeah, and if anything, it, it requires even more creativity. Um, but, you know, really the, the idea of getting everyone on the team uh, march into the same drummer is the, you know, uh, key in, in identifying that beat, you know, identifying that, that heart, that storyline, that oh, big yeah. idea, uh, having uh, every one of the thousands of decisions uh, line up and, and to the point that every time one plus one is added up, they always equal three because yeah. they're always in sync. And um, again, I, I think that's um, the kind of part of the fun of um, even, you know, specifically the work that we get to do with nonprofits, uh, sometimes in developing nations or third world countries, yeah, that's right. regardless of the context, regardless of the client, you can still both foster creativity and create excellence and, and uh, memories. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, it was a real pleasure to hang out with Tony. I um, hope we have a chance to do it again. But those of you listening, uh, maybe for the first time or second time, uh, we really want you to uh, understand our hope and vision behind this podcast. We want you to go back, listen to the other episodes, because we feel like uh, the people that we're bringing on as guests to this program uh, are really uh, people who have a lot to offer. Whether you're in the theme park industry uh, just starting out, whether you're a longtime veteran, there's something to learn from your peers. And that's what we're shooting for is bringing in these peers, give them an opportunity to uh, speak about the projects that they worked so hard on and give you a chance to learn from that, uh, the brain damage that they have incurred, uh, good and bad. So I don't know about you, Mel, I'm exhausted. That's been a lot of interviews. Uh, shall we get creative and turn this boat back to the dock? Let's do it. All right. Until next time. Thanks, Mel. The Themed Attraction Podcast is hosted by Freddie Martin and Mel McGowan. Leave us a review on iTunes Podcasts and share the show with your friends. Our guest today was former Senior Vice President of Creative Development at Walt Disney Imagineering, Tony Baxter. We also recorded video of this episode, so if you prefer your podcast with a little visual stimuli, check out our YouTube channel. Just search Themed Attraction. Get access to more stories and interviews at themedattraction.com, the world's most comprehensive site on theme park design. Follow the action on Instagram and Twitter at Themed Attraction. Connect with Mel by email via mel at storylandstudios.com or follow him on Twitter at Mel McGowan and Instagram at Visioneer. You can find me at freddymartin.net and follow my adventures at Skipper Freddy on Instagram and Twitter. You can find Mike Mulligan or Captain Cosplay as he's known to his superhero friends at Captain Cosplay on Instagram and Twitter. Our theme music was composed by Rob Watson. Other music provided by The Lost Dogs. This episode was designed and produced by the one and only Dr. Barry Hill. Find him at barryrhill.com. You know, Mel, Barry was trying to tell me the other day that tigers are the most honest animals in the jungle. To tell the truth, I don't buy it. I think most of them are lying. Thanks for listening, folks. You spend all the money they've done to make it great.
but put it where it belongs instead of where it doesn't belong, mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. would have been even greater. And the money that they spent tearing out the river, yeah. putting the river back in, tearing out the pony farm, you know, now shepherding the horses mm-hmm. back and forth from Norco, <clears throat> moving the warehouses, doing all this stuff, building berms that are like gigantic to hide it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. None of that would have been spent. You'd take that and say, make the ride better, make this better. If you'd put it on the fallow ground that we've got over on Ball Road by the, um, it was a yeah. trailer park mm-hmm. at Ball and Harbor. Uh, yeah. And we, and we have surface parking on it for the employees. That's all that's there. Yeah. Yep. Now, it's the same size, and if you took the monorail and enclosed it like the uh, Hogwarts Express, Hogwarts yeah. Express <laughs> jettison shuttle, people shuttle out, of, out of yeah. Earth to wherever, and yeah. the doors open, and you can't see Disneyland nope. anywhere. There's no evidence of Disneyland. You can see the sky because we built a cage uh, all around. That, I guess you probably it would have cost. So, and then <laughs> they go, well, no, I wouldn't have said it. I would yeah, get killed. I yeah. That's why um, I didn't bring it in. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, and then you put the, the level of parking underground. <laughs> underground. So in, in all the people hotel, park underground right, yeah. for the employee parking, and then they can ride on the monorails to go back into the park yep. also. So we yep. have a car on there that's for employees mm-hmm. to get to work, you know. Yep. Oh, wow. And so you would have taken care of the bus system yep. with oh. a system that's already running for the everyday yeah. guests, you know. Uh, so that's anyway. astounding.